Good to be here tonight. Amen. I thought about, um, this just came to my mind this afternoon. Turn to Revelation 12. Um, I've done a, a couple of things about Satan as a dragon or um, evil spirits that surround us and they're presented to us in the Bible as dragons or serpents um, and normally in the Bible they, these creatures, dragon serpents, Leviathan, they are always, um, they're very, very strong creatures, they're very powerful, they, um, they are, I think, what I would say a majority, I don't think all of them, but I think a majority of the evil angels that work for Satan, um, I, my, my guess is that a large portion of them have the appearance of like serpents or dragons, uh, any kind of reptile type creature. Um, we know in Revelation 7, let's see, Revelation 17, is it? That, um, no, it's not Revelation 17, I think it's uh, 16. That, as the, yeah, in Revelation 16, 13, one of the angels, the sixth angel, uh, poured out his vial upon the earth. Yeah, verse 13, and frogs came out of their mouth. So, I mean, you know, think about that. Is the Bible giving you some make-believe thing that doesn't really exist, or is that really happening? And I, I say, yes, it's really happening. And the Bible tells you that these frogs are, verse 14, spirits of devils. And I want you to look at verse 14, what they do. What do they do? They work miracles. Wow. They work miracles. And because they're coming out of the mouth, the false prophet, the beast, and the dragon, then what comes out of the mouth is speech. They lie. They represent a lying spirit. Um, just very quickly, if you've ever had... A, that you really honestly felt a spirit lying to you. Has you ever had that experience before? I ha yes, I have. And, um, so, and, the, and these are real things. It's not just a make-believe thing in our mind. And the Bible's not just a meditation guide on how to get rid of bad thoughts. These are real spirits that work against our work. They work against us. They work against our lives. They work against our witness and testimony for Christ. They work against our church. They work against our marriages. They work against friendships and fellowships. Um, that's what they do. And the Bible then gives you all of the information that you need to understand them, to be able to do something about it, to be, able to, to be able to fight a dragon. The Bible gives you the information that you need in order to do that. So, Revelation chapter 12, let's read, uh, we'll read all the nine verses uh, that pertain to Satan as a dragon. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. Uh, and this is in heaven. So I believe that this woman is Jerusalem above, is what I think. Now, I may be wrong, but that's kind of the two things that I put together. Jerusalem above, which is free, which is the mother of us all, because this woman is about to be a mother. So at verse 2, uh, she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. 
Um, and let me add this while I'm, while I'm on this subject. Any good thing from God is going to be accompanied by travail. I believe that. Whenever God... I mean, think about when you were saved. You, when you were saved, you were born. Salvation is a birth. You know, I never asked my mom, you know, what it was really that led her to come down to the altar where she just kind of laid everything out before God. But my guess is there was travail going on in your life. And she was under conviction. The Holy Ghost was dealing with her. And I remember, I had this, these things in my mind of my mom at the altar crying and people praying with her. And that's a good, that's a good thing to remember. Okay? Um, and so that's what happens. Whenever God's going to do a good work in your life, it's a birth. It's a baby. And babies are always great, and there's going to be travail before those good things happen. That's just how it works. So, I mean, this is the world that we live in. So, and it's because of, how did, why did God bring travail in childbearing? Yeah. Yeah, there is a reason why I'm the preacher and she's not, right, God? So, anyway. But she said, so you don't do it again. So anyway, anyway, but it, it goes back to Genesis 3, in sorrow. God said, in sorrow, okay, you're going to bring forth children. And that's just, that's how it happens. So anyway, just if you're, if you're going through a tough time and, and you don't understand why and, and um, you know, you're really trying to, seek God and, and live right and so on. Uh, maybe God's birthing something in your life, all right? So in verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads. And I think as I read that, that wasp flew right over, whatever that is up there, flew right over my light. So I thought maybe that dragon was up there. Um, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars and did cast them to the earth and the dragon stood uh, before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Okay? And uh, let me pray and then I'll say what I'm going to say about that. But she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child, child was caught up. Underline those two words in your Bible, caught up. Because that's Revelation, or that's 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Then which are alive and remain shall be, same two words, exact same two words, caught up. Okay, unto God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of God that they should feed her there, 1,203 score days. So, you know, I may be wrong on this Jerusalem above thing, but anyway. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So we, the Bible's telling you who this dragon is. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. So that, that goes all the way back to Genesis 3. We know who the serpent is. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. And it's something just important to remember as we often attribute, you know, a lot of the bad things that happen to us as the work of the devil. Um, but he's not here full time. So imagine a time when the devil gets locked into being on this earth full time. He will no longer have access to, to God, he will no longer have, uh, he will no longer be making trips to heaven. We we get the idea that Satan does that from the book of Job. The God called in the sons of God, and they all met 
And then Satan came to join in with them. So, that, you know, we kind of taken all these places in the Bible and piecing it together about who the devil is, where he is right now, what he can do, what he can't do right now, and so on. Right now, he, it seems like he has access to the throne. He's the accuser of the brethren. So he stands before God, telling on us night and day about everything that we've done. And then he, God looks to Jesus, and Jesus says, there's nothing written here. It's under the blood. And amen. So, um, but anyway, the, the dragons in the Bible they tell a story. They, they teach us what it is that we run up against and how sometimes we get into places where it just seems like one devil after another is just climbing aboard and we don't know, we don't know what to do about it. We don't know how to deal with it, how to handle it. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll deal with uh, this issue back in um, verse 4 and 5. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this night. I thank you, Lord, for gathering us together into your place. And I thank you, God. God, I thank you that my mama got saved. God, I thank you that you, you worked in her heart. You, she was not bigger than you. Lord, you brought her down low so you could raise her up. And I thank you, Lord, for uh, what she always tried to do at home. I pray that you'd bless her, bless all of her family. And God, when I say bless, I mean God saved them. Save them all. Don't let any of them die and go to hell. Father, we love you and we ask God that you save all of our relatives, all of our friends, the people that we care about. Lord, it's great to save people in the world that we don't even know, but Father, people that we know, we don't want them to die and go to hell. So God... Give it to us, Lord, that we can say something to them or pray for them or whatever. But God, save our, save our friends and our families. And just put it in our heart, God, to remember them in prayer. Pray for them, that you would do with them what you've done with us, God, that you'd bring travail and sorrow in their life and that a new man could be birthed inside of them. Lord, just bless the study of your word tonight. Teach us some good things that we need that we'll carry with us this week. We ask your blessings now in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. Back up in um, verse 3, we have the appearance, the other wonder in heaven. Uh, in Revelation 12, you have two wonders in heaven. Both of them are in heaven. And I just, I always think that maybe, possibly these two are related to uh, what was foretold in Joel chapter 2 and Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when uh, Joel prophesied, Peter was quoting it, and he said, you know, there should be wonders in heaven above. And a lot of people have taken that to mean, you know, like different comets or the alignment of the planets at certain, certain times um, or UFOs appearing or whatever or the four blood moons, which was a big joke. Okay, that, none, of that, none of that stuff they wrote about happened. That ought to tell you, quit reading their books and buy a Bible. Amen, just read the Bible and God will show you. But anyway, uh, a, lot of, you know, a lot of people looked at that thing, and, and I'm not speaking out against it. I'm just saying, I think if the Bible tells us there's two wonders here in heaven, that maybe we ought to look at these as being related to what was prophesied in Joel 2 and Acts chapter 2. So the other wonder in heaven is this great red dragon... And he has seven heads. Now, we, that's Lucifer, that's the devil, that's Satan. And we don't really comprehend what this seven heads things is all about. But the idea of the ten horns, I get. Ten always represents the law. It always represents dominion. And the horns always represent his ability to enforce his power. Let me give you an illustration. Okay? You're driving down the highway, Chris. And you're doing 58 and a half miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone. Huh? Now, it's not confession time. Okay? So anyway, and he hears a horn behind him. Right? When you hear the horn behind you, what? happens next pull over 
That man has forced authority. They call it law enforcement, meaning that against your will, they can and will take away your freedom and liberty, depending on what you did. They will enforce the laws, and they have the horn to do it. Satan has authority in this world. The Bible calls him the God of this world. The Bible calls him the prince of the power of the air. The Bible says, talks about death, and it talks about the one who has power over death. That is the devil. So those ten horns are his ability to enforce or to impose what he wants as directed by God or allowed by God to do what he wants. He has the power to do it. We see that in Job. We see that Satan not only has the power to afflict and affect everybody, and by the way, does the devil have the power to kill people? Because he killed Job's sons and daughters. Killed them. And then the second time around, he would have taken Job's life had God not restrained him. So those horns are real. Just like animals in the animal kingdom use horns to enforce their territory or enforce their domain or one buck tells this buck, you're in my area, get out. And if you don't, I'll use my horns to push you out. That, and that whole idea is given to us in the Bible. Those horns have real authority. They have real power. And the devil and those horns represent evil, cruel authority. You can have it one of two ways. You can serve God and say, God is my Lord, God is my King. God, what God tells me to do, I have to do it. You can live that way. And if you do, your life is going to be full of joy and happiness because there's joy in serving God. How many of you know that? We're here free tonight. I did not say at the end of the service this morning, if you don't show up, you're going to lose your salvation. You're not going to heaven. I did not say that. I said, come. You came because there's joy in it. You came out of free will. You came because you say, you know, there's blessing in the house of God. I want to learn something. I want to be of my peeps. If that's a Bible word, Bible word. Or you can serve the devil. And serving the devil, he's mean about everything. He's not nice. He is cruel. He is hateful. And you'll do what he says to do. These people think they're free, but they're not. They are the servants of sin. They're slaves. That's what they are. So anyway, in verse... Um, and the seven crowns upon his heads also reveals his great authority. So, verse 4, in his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. I think one of these days it's going to be interesting for us to actually find out that those stars that are in the great expanse of the heavens are more than just balls of gas up there. They are angels. Huh? I know it. I do too. I love it. Because I love, I love how they look. I love looking at the stars. I love pictures of the stars, galaxies, clusters, black holes. I mean, and nebulas and every. I mean, I love outer space. I should be there. Huh? One of these days, God's going to let me go. Huh? I'm, I'm, already, I'm already there, okay. So, but a third of these things are going to move out of their place, even some of them in the farthest expanses of heaven, they're going to move out of their place and they're going to be on this earth. Okay? Think Bible. Think that way. I mean, learn science. I love science and I love the science of astronomy and all that stuff. And I believe a lot of what those guys say. Not everything, but I believe a lot of what those guys say. But I'm saying, according to the Bible, that those balls of light are 
living beings that somehow, some way, we'll know it when we see it. We'll go, there they come. So anyway, that's what he has the power to do and to cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Don't you know that every time somebody's converted to Christ, the devil is always right there to devour them. Every time. Who, who remembers that? Who remembers like right after you got saved and boom? You remember that? Okay. Good for you. Don't ever forget that. So it looks like this. See, I don't just sit and watch these things on YouTube for my jollies. I'm learning. I'm learning that serpents have the ability to devour large objects. So, I want you to think of things in your life that Satan, that you had, that Satan devoured because of your sin. Think of what could have been in your life. Think of that. Think of what could have been, what what you probably most wanted in this life, but because of your sin, and you know it, you know it beyond any doubt, you know that Satan, because of your sin, devoured that thing right out of your life, and you'll never have it. It's tough. It's tough to live that way. It's tough to think on these things, but it's true. The devil is a devourer, and it doesn't matter. Actually... I'm going to get my drawing thing out here. Of course, this is an egg. This is a deer. This was a drunk Indian man. That boa or python, whatever it was, that man was drunk, and that snake got on him and choked him and ate him. You see, their jaws, they have on, the, on their jaw, their jaw splits right here. Okay, their bottom jaw splits. And then here, where ours is hooked in, here, what is this called, Lisa? Temporal mandibular joint, TMJ. Okay, where ours is static, a serpent's is hinged to a, a ligament that can stretch a long way and that's how they open their mouth up and they just start making their way across that body God designed them that way okay so if you think listen to me if you think you're too big think again there's a listen there's always a serpent to take you down always Psalm uh, 79 if you want to turn there a couple verses Here's what God says about that. Psalm 79, verse 6. Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that have not known thee, and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name, for they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his dwelling place. Think of, think of, this, think of this woman about ready to give birth to this man-child, and as soon as this man-child is born, for the devil, to, for the dragon to devour that thing, as soon as it's born, Okay? Uh, let, me, let me go back to this. You know what I think of when I, when I see this right here? Snakes love eggs. You know what an egg is? An, a pre-born creature. Huh? Seed. But it's a pre-born. Why do these people want to kill all these babies? Pre-born creatures. What's, what spirit is that that devours the pre-born, the pre-hatched? Okay? There's, there's wisdom in looking at how God created... See, God created this stuff to let us visualize, I think, how the spiritual world works. Because we can't see them. I've never seen a dragon. 
to be honest with you, okay, I never drank that stuff, so I didn't see dragons, all right? But, okay, but they're real. And I believe this is how they operate. They devoured Jacob and laid waste to his dwelling place. Satan is a devourer. He will devour. And like I said, I had you think about things that the devil devoured. I'm not going to ask you because some of those things may be very personal and very painful to you. But think about, think about the years of sin that you lived in. Think about the money that you lost in sin. Think of the relationships that can never, ever be right again because they were devoured. That's hard to take. To know that because of your sin, that's how it ended up. And that, just never, that, that bridge is burnt. It'll never be rebuilt. Okay? So think about all the things that you lost to the devourer because of your sin. Isaiah 9, 12, the Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with open mouth. I mean, look at that. That's exactly what those serpents do. Devour with an open mouth. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. You see, now listen. Okay, you've had the devil eat things up out of your life, but you're still here. You're still here. God is, that's exactly right, Jody. His hand is still stretched out to you in love. Malachi 3.11, God said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. In fact, let's turn to Malachi chapter 3 and find out why God rebukes the devourer. Does anybody, want, does anybody know this passage? Does anybody know what it's related to? Huh? Nope. Not this. I mean, it's in that, it's later on, but it's not, it's not, that's not what this is related to. Go back to verse 10. What is it? Verse 10, what is it? Tithes and offerings. Remember what I said this morning. God will never sit in the back seat while you drive. Never. God will never be a passenger on your plane or on your stagecoach. And whatever vehicle I can come up with, God is never going to sit anywhere else except how it's steered and where it goes. God will always place himself first in your life or you'll know it. Okay? Now, I do not. I've, I've spent years in the ministry. Rose will tell you, I don't look to see who pays what. I don't want to know. Don't care. It's between you and God. Okay, and I don't preach on, I don't sit and dwell on money, preach on money, and I've heard churches that do, I've heard of preachers that do, especially those that are trying to accomplish something big, they always hitting everybody up for money. Money, money, money is everything, and I don't do that, but I'm telling you, there are issues, there are biblical issues related to your finances, and your finances will never, ever be right. Until God's first. Never. You're, what you're doing is you, God gave you. God gave you a job. God gave you money. God gave you a house. God gave you a place. God gave you clothes. God gave you food. God gave you everything. God gave you the health. I mean, you could be one of those guys that come to our, from our group home. And have to have somebody feed you and clothe you and bathe you all the time. God gave you the ability to stand up on your own two feet and go about your life and do something with yourself. And then so what you do is you put God in the back seat. So boy, I got this money. There's no telling where I'm going with this. And God said, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse. 
that there may, may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it, and I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes. So you ask the question. If, and it doesn't matter if it's finances, relationships, your walk with God, your Bible time, your prayer time, coming to church, it doesn't matter what area of life we can open up and examine in your life, which that's between you and God to do, but whatever area of life this thing is in, there is, a, there is a dragon there to devour that part of your life, and you'll never get it back. Or, it may be that God devours it because He has something better for you, and He won't let you have it because you're hanging on to the old something old. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, I mean, I've done that before. Hanging on, hanging on something old, hang on to this, hang on to that. And God's got something brand new for you, better than you ever had. But we want to hang on to this old stuff, and God says, let it go. In fact, I'm going to send a serpent out there to eat it up. And you'll whine and cry and throw a fit and everything else until I show you what I've had in store for you this whole time. And that's what God did when you got saved, is it not? You were hanging on that old life and those old sins. And you said, I want to give them up. I want to give them up. I, 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 and... And you had no idea how good it would be when God took over your life. So he let the devil devour all that stuff up out of your life so he could say, here you go. But when it, I, I'm just going to say this, I'm going to move on. When it comes to your money, your money is your money. If God gave it to you, it's yours. Is it not? Did you not earn it? So you got it. So you are free to do whatever you want to do with it. And you are free to rob God if you so desire. It's your choice. But it's a stupid one. It is. It is. Lisa and I, we found this out. God challenged us early on in our marriage on tithing. And we found out it's better to let God pay our bills. Okay? And it's better to let God handle that stuff and to put Him first. Okay? So that's my, what would that take, 10 minutes? 10 minutes out of how many sermons do I do a week? And when's the last time I ever brought up money in a message? Okay? I'm just telling you, I don't like to be like all those other guys but I do have to bring it up every now and then because this is part of our life and testimony. God promised, God, God promised, and he starts out mean in verse 8, will a man rob God? I mean, he's coming right at you saying, you're stealing from me, okay? And you say, what? We didn't rob God. Yeah, tithes and offerings. Tithes and what? All, yeah, tithes is, we, how much is a tithe? And that's easy. If it's a dollar, it's a Dime. See how easy that is? Okay, just move that dot two places, and you got it. What is an offering? That's where your heart is. That's where you just give. Huh? Oh, the, okay, the widow's might. I get what you're saying now. I couldn't hear you. I got a fan blowing in this here. Okay. Uh, for all of you who have helped out to feed the people in Kenya, okay, they have not passed around a card yet with money in it to send back to us as payment for the food. Wouldn't take it. It's not why we did it. Okay, that was out of our heart to them. And I, I Michael, you're going to have to give me the videos. There's videos of them singing and dancing, thanking God and naming Bethel Church. That's all they had to do for us, but they did it, okay? So I'm just saying, there's a devourer in your life eating things up, 
And in, when you put God in the seat where He belongs, God will rebuke that devourer. Okay? Uh, Jeremiah 30. Look at this. All they that devour thee shall be devoured, and all thine adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity, and they that spoil thee shall be a spoil, and all they that prey upon thee will I give for a prey. One... Two, three, four. Look at that verse. Is there not four things that God says in there? All that devour thee shall be devoured. All thy adversaries shall go into captivity. All they that spoil thee shall be a spoil. And all they that prey upon thee will I give for a prey. Four things in there because of the cross. That's what God said he'll do. That is an actual picture of a serpent eating himself. They actually do that. Of course, they don't procreate, thank God. But they do that. And there's a symbol related to that in the occult realm of a serpent biting, eating its own tail. And they say, oh, that's a, that's a good symbol. That's a positive symbol of reincarnation or new life or new birth. No, it's not. No, it's not. Not when you know the Bible. When you know the Bible, that is God turning all of your enemies against themselves. Is what that is. God turning your enemies against themselves. Galatians 5.15 But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. So, according to all this, what does God do to people who sit and just devour other people? They get devoured. This Bible's always right. Always right, guys. Uh, and then, of course, I put a, this is called a, do you know what this is called, Todd? Sorry. Called a wyvern, or a wyvern. It's sort of a, like a dragon with a lion's deal. It's like a combination dragon-lion thing. Because be sober, be vigilant, because you're ever seen the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And, you know, I've mentioned several times before about Christ being the lion, lion of the tribe of Judah and the devil's the roaring lion, so how do, how do you know which one's which? When you serve Christ, he roars against your enemies. Okay? And they're afraid of him. And the thing about lions, they have built-in crowns. The lion's mane is his crown. He is king. And it's really neat. You ought, to, you ought to come sit in my office for a while while I'm watching all this stuff. These male lions, when, when they have established dominance, first thing they do, watch this now. When a male lion wants to take over a pride, if he finds the female lions and they've had cubs, they will kill all those cubs. Because they will not raise children that are not theirs. They'll kill them. They'll kill every one of them. Okay? It's unusual for them to actually eat them, but it's been, it's been seen before. Okay? But when, they, when that male lion takes over a pride, once he has killed all the offspring of his enemy, think about it. Once he's killed the offspring of his enemy, he established his dominion over those female lions and you will hear him with this low guttural, woo, woo, like that. It's not quite like that, but it's sort of like that. But what he's doing, he is announcing to everybody, and you can hear this from miles, this is my territory now. And if you're smart, you'll stay out of it. Okay, he's establishing his dominance. And what I see is Christ roaring against his enemies okay but if it's the devil he's coming looking for you because remember what i just said a lion that's going to take over a pride what will he do to the offspring kill him he's going to try to kill the children of the the dominant male 
that's his token that he has in fact taken over that pride. He'll not raise children that are not his. And it goes either way. It goes from the devil's side. The devil will not help raise you for Jesus Christ. You ponder that for a while. Let me get into this and we'll... This is one of those nights I wouldn't mind staying on midnight. Keep going. Deuteronomy 32. Turn there. Dragons. So that's number one. Dragons devour. If you're making notes, that's dragons devour. Number two. Dragons have poison. Dragons have poison. They're poisonous animals. Deuteronomy 32. Verse 31. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom, and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons. The cruel venom of asps is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures. Now, one thing I'm going to help you with as far as the science is concerned. There is, the word dinosaur was not invented till the mid-1800s, which is obviously a couple hundred years after the, the writing of the King James Bible. But I am, I am positive that, number one, dinosaurs and man live together. I believe the Bible. And number two, the Bible word for them was dragon. Dragon is an all-encompassing, you're not going to find the scientific classification of reptile in the Bible. What you're going to find is dragon and serpent. So that, would, that would encompass, I, I would think, all of the reptile kingdom. Whether they are lizards walking on four legs, or they are snakes going about on their belly, they are still of the... The dra- how the Bible would say it, the Bible would classify them as dragons and or serpents. And we've already seen in Revelation 12 that Satan is both. He is a serpent and he is classified by God as a dragon. So in the, in the real realm that you and I can see, there are snakes and there are lizards And one of the largest of them, what's the largest? This is for J.R. Caleb and I don't see anybody else. The largest lizard existing now is what? J.R. and Caleb. Huh? Huh? Komodo dragon, give me my hand. There he is. And there was a debate among scientists. At first, some of them said, well, they got poison in their mouth. And then somebody came along and said, no, it's not real poison. It's that their mouth develops as bacteria. And when they bite their victim, all they have to do is wait because it infects them and they die of the infection. But some have come along and said now, no, it's, they actually have poison in their mouth. Okay? And what they will do is they will find goats or whatever, deer or whatever, and all they got to do is bite them. They, they look at those teeth. They are razor, and they're all leaning, they're all leaning in. They're all pointed toward the throat. Which basically, you're just taking, like they can take huge chunks out of whatever animal they got, just devour it, okay? But when they bite, they inject their venom. They have poison in their mouth. And that poison, all they got to do then is wait for that goat to lay down. All they got to do is bite him once. And then if he runs off by scent, because of their tongues, they detect where it ran off to, and, th- and they know then that that goat or that deer or whatever is going to die because they bit it. And once they get there, they are immune to their own poison, and they will rip apart, they'll use each other to rip apart that goat or that deer or whatever, 
and eat it all up between them. There's actual poison in their mouth, as is per the Bible. And here's the poison. Psalm 58, 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born. Speaking lies. There's their poison right there. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They're like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear. You know, you can... In other words, you ever seen ears on a snake? Big floppy ears? They don't have them. You know what God... And he mentions this in the Bible. You know what God signifies by that? You can give commands to most creatures in this world. A human can train an animal... Give them commands and have that animal respond to those commands. Serpents don't. And here's the point in this. You cannot negotiate with a dragon. He will not hear you. He does not obey your commands. Psalm 140, Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart continually. They are gathered together for war. They've sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. So what it means is the things that they say. Now, all young people here, all young people online, don't you listen to this. Romans 3. They're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues, they've used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. When I was a boy, my dad, he would curse every now and then. But there was only two words that he said in front of in front of me or in front of Melissa, that I, that I remember. The ones that are commonly used, okay? Hell and whatever. He never said, as part of, if he would get mad and curse or talk to one of his guys or whatever, I hate that F word. I hate it. And I say that men's mouths and women, as far as cursing, it is far more common now for men and women both and teenagers to say F words and other sexual slang words than it was even when I was a boy, see, I used to go, my dad worked on a Corps of Engineers dredge boat, and I used to go under with him, and I listened, I hear, I listened to those guys talk. They were sailors, literally, they were on a boat, on a vessel, they were on a river, they were sailors, and they, they talked like it. But even then, I do not remember them talking the way people talk normally now. Now, I don't know if any of you or anybody online has a problem with cursing. I don't know that because most people won't do it in front of the preacher. Or it used to be that way. But if you do, get it under the blood and let God tame it. That is the mark of a lost man, not a saved one. Right? Now, I'm not questioning your salvation. What I'm saying to you is, saved people don't talk that way. Amen? They don't. So the poison is in the form of, these are all biblical things, false doctrines. And sometimes it's easy, you know, when somebody says, well, I don't think Christ was God. We know that's false. You know, when they say, Mary, she's, she hears your prayers, that's false. We can identify those things. But some of the false doctrines now that have sprung up, they're very subtle. And they're designed to be subtle, and they're designed to catch people. You never hear the snake coming that bites you. False teachers. And they are 
everywhere now. They are everywhere. False prophets, false Bibles, books, any kind of books. Any kind of book can contain things in it that are meant to guide your mind and your heart away from God's truth. Articles on the internet, social media, memes. Memes are very powerful because they grab people's attention. You either make them laugh or to make them angry or to incite some sort of emotional response. And they're designed to do it very quickly. But anything that plants an idea in your mind that is contrary to the Word of God is poison. So social media, news, news articles, com- most news is not giving you the facts. They're giving you, their, they're giving you a commentary on the facts. They're giving you a slant of what they want you to think and believe. And it works. Who knows music lyrics that are just pure poison? Huh? Jody, stand up and sing some the old st- stuff. Listen, I know some of the stuff you used to listen to. I know you're trying to forget it. I'll honor that. But there's poison in them. Huh? Movies are full of poison. TV shows, full of poison. Commercials, full of poison. Friends, I don't mean the TV show Friends, but that would be included in it. Your friends, your friends will drag you to hell with them. They absolutely will drag you to hell with them. Okay, this is the devil. This is the dragon. He's got poison, and it's hidden poison. It's under his tongue, meaning that it's very subversive, but it'll kill you. He'll devour. The whole purpose, I mean, why does a serpent bite a victim? Why do they do it? But why are they trying to kill it? Eat it. Either you represent a threat or he means to absolutely devour you. And he'll strike you with lies and he'll do it every time. And the the sad of it is, I have believed lies before. And then when somebody tells me a lie and I believe it, then I find out later that they lied to me. Boy, that gets me. That's hard for me to overcome. I don't like being lied to, but a lot of people lie to the preacher. So, how many of you know some dragons? Poison. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're here to learn. And there's a lot to learn, a lot in the Bible, Lord, that still I want to learn. I want to know more than I know now. I want it for me. I want it to be able to share it with my wife. I want to be able to share it with my children. I want my grandchildren to hear it. I want God, I want my my family, my, my church people here. I want to know it so I can tell it to them. And then they can go search it on their own, how, how you are going to affect this in their life or apply it in their life. Because how the devil strikes me and devours things of me different than other people. But the, Lord, these principles are the same. And God, you've reminded me more times than I want of the things that the devil has devoured from my life that I'll never get back. But the things, God, that you have given me are far better. So I'm not complaining, God. I just wish that I never disobeyed you ever. So, Father, we ask, God, that you just make us mindful 
to give you the first chair in our life. The king's seat. Because you're the only one that belongs there. We don't. And Father, will you rebuke the devourer in our lives? Because probably most of us probably have one. Father, will you rebuke the devourer? And give us, give us the inoculation against the poison. So we always know and obey the truth. I love you, God. I love you, Jesus. I thank you, Spirit. And I thank you for this Bible. Magnify your word tonight in the hearts of your people, we pray in Jesus' name. All the God's people said, Amen. Amen.